Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our last chapter of BI 232. We are wrapping up the cardiovascular system um, with a discussion on blood vessels, uh, which includes their anatomy, blood pressure, production and regulation, and kind of distribution of blood vessels. So um, I usually start off with a just kind of a visual. If you've ever gone to a bodies exhibit, um, one of my favorite parts of those human bodies exhibits are the blood vessel room because they have this way of stripping everything away from the body uh, except for the blood vessels. And so you can kind of see this display here on the screen. Um, it's really fascinating. They had individual organs, different like a leg or an arm or the lungs or the kidney. And the whole shape of the organ can be told just by the distribution of blood vessels. You don't need anything else but the blood vessels, um, which really kind of helps you visualize how vascular our bodies really are. Um, so there's always a thing like if you took all of your blood vessels out of your body and laid them end to end, they would wrap around the earth like two and a half times or something, about 62,000 miles or over 100,000 kilometers if you like metric. Um, somebody had told me they saw a bumper sticker that says if you took all of the bl blood vessels out of your body and laid them end to end, you'd be dead. Well, that is true. Um, so this is uh, the first video we're going to take a look at is the anatomy of blood vessels. So we're going to take a look specifically at the differences, um, the structures, the differences between arteries, veins, and capillaries. All right. So when we take a look at um, the wall of a blood vessel. So before we get too far into this, just to clarify, when we talk about arteries, arteries are the blood vessels that move blood away from the heart. So I always remember that because A for artery and A for away. So any blood vessel that is at the, you know, moving blood from the heart out to the body, away from the heart, those are called arteries. And then the blood vessels that are bringing the blood back to the heart after it's passed through all the capillary beds, those are veins. So the veins go back to the heart, the arteries carry blood away from the heart. And then the capillaries are just the connectors in between. So keep that in mind. Um, arteries are away, veins are back too in reference to the heart. All right, so when we take a look at the walls of arteries and veins and capillaries to some degree, there are three layers. Um, called tunic. So tunic just means like coat or layer. So their names are pretty um, intuitive. So tunica externa is the outermost layer. Tunica media is the middle layer. And tunica intima is the innermost layer. Now I think your lab manual might call it tunica interna, which is fine. Either of those um, terms are okay. Intima or interna for the innermost layer. So when we take a look at the, what these layers are made out of, so the tunica externa is um, kind of a connective tissue. It's a sheath, just like we have seen in a lot of our other organs. So we had a periosteum, we had the epimyceum, um, we have these um, capsules around organs, like what we saw around the adrenal gland and the pancreas and things like that. So it's this connective tissue sheath, probably a dense, irregular connective tissue, high concentrations of collagen fibers. Then we have the tunica media. So the tunica media is smooth muscle, right? So smooth muscle for tunica media. And then the tunica intima is an epithelial lining uh, laying over some probably areolar connective tissue, like a um, lamina propria. So both arteries and veins have all three of these layers. But if you look at them, there are some significant differences between the wall of an artery and the wall of the vein. The tunica externa looks pretty much the same. But look at the tunica media. That's going to be our, one of our biggest differences. It is quite thick in an artery, um, and it is a lot thinner in a vein. And the reason for that is because, again, think about where these blood vessels are. So arteries are found going away from the heart, and the heart is pumping. We just got done covering how, how much pressure the heart can produce, that left ventricle. So the walls of arteries have to be a lot stronger than those of veins and they have to have some flex. They have to be able to expand and recoil with every pulse of blood that's coming through um, at every heartbeat. So tunica medias allow to withstand, these thicker tunica medias on arteries allow them to withstand that um, stretch and recoil uh, being close to the pumping site of the heart. Veins don't need that. There's no pulse in a vein. There's no high pressure. Veins are low pressure systems, so you don't need quite that much tunica media as protection or um, to be able to withstand that pulses because there just isn't any. 
The tunica intima is pretty similar. So it's a simple squamous epithelium, or sometimes called the endothelium, that's sitting on some tunica or some lamina propria. But if you'll notice in the artery, the tunica intima epithelial, that simple squamous epithelium, is kind of wrinkly. And again, that goes to this idea that when the pulse comes through, the arteries have to expand and then recoil, expand and recoil. So in the recoiled state, when there's not a big bolus of blood kind of pushing through the blood vessel, that uh, endothelium kind of wrinkles on itself. We don't see that in uh, veins. There's no pulse in veins. So they are just a continuous uh, flow of blood. So they don't wrinkle up on themselves like you would see in an artery. Okay. All right. And then lastly, the major, uh, one of the major differences between the walls of um, arteries and veins is in arteries, you have elastic fibers. So there is an internal and an external elastic membrane. Sometimes it's called uh, elastic lamina, which just means layer. In your lab manual, it kind of looks like layers of Swiss cheese, kind of the yellowy structures with holes in it is like, kind of that's what it looks like to me. Um, but basically it is just your, um, Let's go with highlighter. Um, internal and external elastic membranes. It's just a high concentration of elastic fibers, again, allowing for the stretch and recoil um, when the pulse is traveling through those arteries because they are closer to the pump of the heart. Okay. So then when we take a look at the different kinds of arteries, veins, and capillaries, we can see that they do have some classification based on their size and location. Um, in reference to the heart. So starting with the arteries, because that's blood moving away from the heart, our largest of our arteries are what we call the elastic arteries. So like your aorta, your subclavian um, arteries, brachial arteries, these are not brachial, I think brachial is the next category. Um, yes, aorta pulmonary trunk, there we go. Those large ones coming off of the heart are gonna be our large elastic arteries. Um, and then they just kind of reduce in size to muscular arteries. So this would include things like your parotid, brachial, mesenteric arteries are good examples of the muscular artery. And then we move down and so those are all branching all over the place. And then we go down into a smaller type of artery, which is called an arteriole. Now, if we take a look at an arteriole um, and those three tunics, we should see that one of those is missing. So we have the tunica intima, which is basically the endothelium sitting on a basement membrane, and then it's surrounded by smooth muscle, but it is missing the tunica externa. And the reason for this is by because by the time you're at the arterial level, the blood vessel has branched to go inside a structure or an organ. So it doesn't need quite the protection the tunica externa provides, um, like if you're just traveling through the body, you're rubbing up against the outsides of organs, bones, and muscles, but by the time you're at an arterial, you're inside the organ, so you're pretty well protected already. But you still have the smooth muscle because this is the prime location of where um, vasodilation and vasoconstriction happen. So when we talk about blood vessels constricting or dilating, getting smaller and bigger based on the need of the organ, it's not so much at your elastic and muscular arteries, it's primarily taking place at the arterioles within organs. And then we get down into the capillary. So we have two types, we're gonna talk a little bit more about capillaries on the next slides. But a continuous capillary is, the, is kind of very common, probably the most abundant of our types of capillaries. And if you look at its layers, it really all is left with the tunica intima. It is the endothelial cells, a simple squamous epithelium with a little bit of connective tissue basement membrane that it has to stick to. No arterioles, no, uh, sorry, no arterioles, no tunica media, no tunica externa, just the tunica intima, which is simple squamous epithelium, and this is the location of all of the exchange, which is going to be a whole other video on itself. Um, and then next to that, they're showing an example of a fenestrated capillary. Fenestrated capillaries are only found in certain locations in the body where you need a lot more exchange than you would normally with a continuous capillary, and fenestration just means these cells, these simple squamous cells that are making the endothelium have pores in them, so a whole bunch of holes are popped in them. Um, but their holes are okay. It's not like we're going to lice the cell. These are actually on purpose pores to increase the movement of things across the capillary. All right. Capillary beds drain into veins um, and they start with kind of a um, similar type of structure as an arterial called a venule. So it's a small vein. It is still located kind of within the organ itself 
and it lacks a tunica media. So it's just endothelium and some connective tissue around that to the tunica externa. The venules will fuse into our medium-sized veins. Let me see if I have an example. Medium-sized veins, um, oh, I don't have an example, but that would be like your brachial vein, your um, radial and ulnar veins, the kind of the, the the veins that are on your blood vessel list would be, most of those are gonna be considered medium-sized veins. And then those are going to fuse and blend into your large veins, which your brachiocephalic vein, your superior and inferior vena cavas are all great examples of these large veins. And they have all three layers, like medium-sized veins, again, a small tunica media, the endothelium um, of the tunica intima, and the tunica externa. All right, so those are kind of the distribution, I don't know if that's the right word, the classifications, the different types of arteries, capillaries, and veins that we have. Okay. So this um, slide is just showing us closer look at the difference between the continuous and fenestrated capillaries and also talking about another type called sinusoids. So here on the left, you can see the continuous capillaries, just, you know, simple squamous epithelium making up the endothelial part of the tunica intima. And then on the right or the middle picture, you can see the fenestrated capillaries with the pores increasing the exchange. And then sinusoids are even more rare than fenestrated capillaries. Um, they're found in places where you need to trans, um, um, exchange large structures like plasma proteins. So you're going to find a lot of these in the liver, maybe some endocrine organs. So fenestrated capillaries, not only do you see um, pores, sorry, sinusoids, kind of my, half my, my face is covering up half the word, you see these large gaps, okay? So you don't see these large gaps in either continuous or fenestrated capillaries. Everything's nice and sealed tight. And it might even have tight junctions, keeping those adjacent cells tightly closed. And so the only way stuff can go through is actually through the cell or through a pore. But with sinusoids, you have these big gaps that things that are too large to go through a pore or diffuse through the plasma membrane or a carrier can make it either into the blood or out of the blood at these locations where you have the sinusoids. All right. And still more on capillary. So we're going to take a closer look here at what a capillary bed is. So here we can see our um, path of our arteries, right? So these would be our small, medium, smaller arteries with the, all three layers. And now we're getting to arterioles. So remember, arterioles are just the endothelium, with um, the smooth muscle tunica media, no tunica externa. And then this whole thing here is our capillary bed, right? So here's all of our capillaries. These are these small, tiny little connectors that connect the arterial side to the venule side of your circulation. We are a closed circuit organism. So our blood isn't supposed to leave this closed circuit. We just keep you know, going around and around and around, um, unlike other animals where their blood can go into open spaces. That's not us. We don't have an open circulatory system. We have closed, and it's the capillaries that connect the arterial side with the venule side or the venous side. Um, but this is where all the magic happens. You know, A lot of times arteries and veins get all the um, press, but it really is, there we go, um, the capillaries where the whole purpose of the blood supply is to bring blood to the capillaries. So within a capillary bed, some really important structures here um, are the precapillary sphincters. So these guys act like little gatekeepers. And so what they can do is they open and close um, capillaries based on the demand of the tissue. So in all this white space, you have to remember there's cells in here. So I'm drawing just some little cuboidal cells. They could be muscle cells. They could be glandular cells. These are the customers. These are where why we have capillaries because it is in these small capillaries, the walls are thin enough to allow for oxygen and carbon dioxide to diffuse, for nutrients and waste products to be, be carried. This is where our cell customers get fed and drop off their waste products in the capillaries. So if you're not a very active tissue at the moment, you don't want to send your a bulk of a nice big bulk of your blood through this capillary bed of a non active tissue. So you can cinch down those pre-capillary sphincters and let the blood kind of bypass and then just go back into general circulation through this anastomosis, which is a just a connector 
you don't have exchange through that. And you can see because there's smooth muscle, right? If it's smooth muscle surrounding, it's too thick for exchange. So if you don't have an active tissue, the blood will just bypass the capillary bed. But then let's say you're, you're starting to become active. The cells demand more oxygen or they're burning carbon dioxide or releasing carbon dioxide and they have to get rid of it. So we'll open up those precapillary sphincters. The blood will then go through the capillary bed, you know, delivering the goodies to the tissue customers, the cell customers, and then continuing on to the venules and veins. So precapillary sphincter is very important in the regulation of how much blood gets delivered to the customer cells. Okay. All right, um, another feature of veins, so we looked at arteries, a little bit of detail on capillaries, and then a unique feature in veins is they have valves. So we've already mentioned how veins are a low pressure system. So you might be thinking, okay, so the left side of the heart pumps the blood out to the body and the heart's way up here and most of our body is below, so that works out good. But what about all that blood that has to come back to the heart up four or five, six feet, I guess, if you're really tall, back to the heart. How does that happen? Well, there is blood pressure in veins, but it is relatively low. So there has to be other mechanisms to help bring that blood back to the heart. And the valves are one of those major functions or structures. So these are one-way valves and they rely on the low pressure in the venous side of the circulatory system, but they also rely on comp compression of skeletal muscles. So as you're moving your body, you're walking, right? Um, they compress on the, the veins and the blood can only go up because it cannot go backwards. If the muscle relaxes, those valves close and keep that blood from going back down and pooling into lower parts of your body. Um, so those are valves and they're only found in veins of the blood supply. We'll see your lymphatics have valves, but that's next term, totally different chapter. Okay. The last thing we're going to cover in this video is just a distribution of where the blood is in any moment of time. So if you're to take a snapshot, where's all your blood? You have like five liters, five to six liters of blood, right? We learned that back in chapter 19. So where is those, well, where, where is that five or six liters of blood? Now, it's kind of interesting to see that most of the blood, about two thirds of the blood, is in your veins at any given moment. And it's pretty evenly distributed between your large veins, your venous networks, like your liver, bone marrow, and skin, and your venules and medium sized veins. So they're about 20, 25%. That's huge, right? And okay, so what about our arteries? Systemic arteries, only about 13%. So between our arteries and veins, just the systemic arteries and veins, um, we have, we're going on 60, 70, almost 80% of your blood is just in your arteries and veins. Well, didn't we say that all the magic happens in the capillary beds? Yeah, well, let's see how much. Oh my goodness. In your systemic capillary beds, only about 7% of your whole blood volume at any one time is in your capillary beds doing the thing the blood needs to do with another 9%. So we'll add those together because that's really important. Or actually, just if we're just looking at the capillaries, 2% where all the magic happens. So 9% of your whole blood volume at any one moment in time is actually doing the stuff that exchange that needs to be done. 2% in the pulmonary circuit, dropping off CO2, picking up oxygen. 7% in all the rest of your body capillary beds, dropping off oxygen, picking up carbon dioxide, dropping off nutrients, picking up waste products, dropping off hormones, picking up hormones, dropping off ions, picking up ions. All of that stuff is happening with only 9% of your blood. The other 91% of your blood is just traveling. It's en route. It's in your veins going back to your heart. It's in your heart. Only about 7% of your blood volume is held in your heart at any one moment of time. And then about, let's see, 7, 20% is kind of in your systemic and pulmonary arteries and veins. Pretty amazing statistics there. I just find that fascinating that with all of the capillaries that we have, they're so small, um, only about 9% of our blood can fit through them at any one moment of time, but it's enough to allow us to survive and live. Okay, that wraps up our anatomy of blood vessels. Um, next, we're gonna take a look at blood pressure, kind of what generates blood pressure and um, 
kind of the factors that affect blood pressure. All right, I'll see you next time. Bye.